Welcome to a special edition of the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. And welcome to a special edition of the ODPH. I'm your host, Ken M, and we're not in the actual ODPH studios. We're on assignment because the Polar Vortex has kicked us out of our normal haunts. But we're doing a spotlight edition because there's a very big show coming February 9th at Subterranea. If you don't know the location, you got to find it on Facebook, and you can definitely go to our guest page. They definitely have all the information on it, as they will be playing with Amber Martin, Unethical, The Challenged, and Floodlands, who we actually have a special guest host in for this episode. You know him from Floodlands. You know him from Crimson Brethren. It is the most downloaded guest in ODPH history. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Jimmy Gazdick. Thanks, Ken. Thanks for having me again. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for coming on the show. And Absolutely. And then last but certainly not least, the guest we have in the studio. If you are not familiar with Shout at the Robots, get ready to find out what they're all about. Joining us in studio, Julian Hepworth, Ross Marchuka, Matt Jane, and John McBride. Shout at the Robots. Guys, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having us. So we're going to start asking them a little questions. Hit us up on that social media. Hashtag S-A-T-R today, folks, because we definitely want to make this all about Shout at the Robots. So going around the room, where are you guys from? Uh, we are all collectively from Owego. And I'd also like to preface that and say that this is the first time Shout at the Robots has ever had our own hashtag. So thank you. Oh, no problem. Definitely worth it. So you guys are from Owego, New York, mm-hmm. to clarify for our international listeners. This is true. And so how did you guys all get into music? Uh, that's a really excellent question. Uh, the first time I ever remember even hearing a song and it having a really distinct effect on me was uh, Losing My Religion by R.E.M., which okay. I was like Great song. three when that came out. Uh, and my grandma used to play it to me all the time, and it had like a really profound effect. And I think that was probably the first time I went... Yeah, this is cool. Let's do this for the rest of my life. Uh, around my household, there would always be like Frank Sinatra or something playing, and that, I got big into that when I was younger. But my brother uh, was a huge Fish fan, and he like he took me to my first show I think when I was about six or seven in Albany, and that was a pretty wild experience. He also would have like a bunch of CDs and everything, and it'd be from like rap to metal to like punk and everything. And uh, there'd be like a few times where I'd just sneak in and steal some of his CDs to play. I got my own time. Uh, but he would always do this game in the car where it'd be like, I'll give you five bucks if you can name this band. So how much did you wind up winning on like a, on a night? Mm, well, <laughs> the best part about it was he'd always say it and then I'd always fall for it because he never ended up giving me any money. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> But at least that's like that's a really cool way about getting exposed to music too, because especially if you're just going through like a you know old CD packet, you know, and just getting just the exposure to it. I mean, I think that's just got to be something, especially at a young age, you're getting exposed to so much different styles. It's not just like one or the other. Yeah, like, uh, he was just a huge fish fan, and then like everybody just thinks that's like my whole ordeal. But it's just I grew up with a bunch of different things. All right, that's, sounds that's awesome. <laughs> I guess I'd, for me, I don't really have like a defining moment that I got into music. I just always kind of loved music a lot. And uh, like Ross was saying, my parents would always play music. They were both big Beatles fans. Yeah. But I got a lot of like the classic rock influence from my dad. I loved Hendrix and Jimmy Page. I always wanted to play guitar where my mom was more into like funk and R&B. And I feel like that's where I got kind of like my bass style. And I, I like a lot of funk and stuff like that. All right. But, uh, Who are some of your favorite bass players? <laughs> oh, that's that's a tough one. But uh, Mike Watt is probably my all-time favorite bass player, and he's not nice. somebody I really grew up listening to. I got I got more into him in like high school, I would say. But I always loved you know Jack Bruce and people like that. Uh, Lemmy, I loved Getty oh, Lee. Yeah. People like that. Like I said, classic rock was a big big thing for me. And then I got more into punk from that, Ramones, that kind of stuff. And Oh, yeah. That's, huh. that's you know. good stuff, man. <laughs> that's good stuff. Uh, I think the moment that uh, got me into music, like, really into it, was just back in, like, uh, middle school and high school and just, like, watching the rest of these guys, like, play in the bands and stuff and, then like, seeing it from the outside. And, I don't know, it just looked great. And then finally actually being able to do it, too, was awesome. Yeah. 
I mean, there's just so much an eclectic mix here too, because we were talking about REM and then we're talking about Fish and the Beatles and classic rock and just like everything can molded into one. And especially like growing in such a young age. So when you were really like, okay, now I'm hooked on music. Music is just having this much of an impact. You know, where did you kind of really sense like, okay, that's where I want to go with this? That's an interesting question. Um, we've all known each other since we were really little kids, varying ages, but super small. I have a really early memory of being with John in my living room and uh, having one of my dad's acoustic guitars and just having zero idea how to play it, but we were just like putting on a show. <laughs> and just that I think that was probably our first taste of that addictive potential of performance. And, you know, I think from there we were just hooked. Another thing for me, I just, I was never really like good at much and not a lot of people played music our age and that was kind of something like oh i can do this and it's not like what everybody else is doing and something i could be good at that maybe other people don't do no that makes sense because especially like i say starting out and you're just kind of really kind of finding your own vibe and just kind of you know gravitating toward like what you're getting exposed to at such a young age mm -hmm. and then you're deciding you really want to start performing jimmy you got a question you want to ask the guys oh uh, yeah I, I want to start with julian first uh what was your first instrument you ever picked up Technically, I guess I would say drums. Uh, I played drums with air quotes uh, <laughs> yeah. when when I was in um, middle school or elementary school into like the beginning of middle school, and it was just like you know I hit a snare drum once in a while. Cool, um, but it it was really rigid and weird, and um, the guy that taught it maybe not the nicest guy in the world. Uh, so all that combined. It wasn't a super great introduction to doing that kind of thing. Yeah. And then uh, when I was 12, my parents bought me an electric guitar and a little amp. Uh, it was an ESP, I think. It had like a picture of Metallica nice. on the front. And, uh, <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. And uh, that That's was pretty badass. <laughs> I know, right? And that that was it. Uh, that that was the gateway for me. Cool. Um, yeah. And You've been there ever since, I yeah. see. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. Um, it was a combination of them buying the guitar and uh, I started taking lessons from a local guy named Paul Napick, who I absolutely have to credit everything I do to uh, because his approach. Awesome. Yeah. His approach, as opposed to, you know, learn Mary Had a Little Lamb and play it 6,000 times, mm -hmm. what he would do. You would bring in a CD because this was still the age of CDs. <laughs> God, how we miss it! Oh yes, and, uh, I still know, buy them. Right? I still try yeah. to, but yeah, yeah, but they're all you know. Obviously, it's now again switched to digital, but yeah. it's tough. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, he would ask you to bring in a CD, and you know, he'd start with "Give me your favorite song," and I'll show you how to play that. And he would show you obviously like a really simplified version of what you're doing. I think for me, it was. Um, back in black or hell's bells or something okay uh, awesome. and yeah that his teaching style was just to take the thing that you loved and show you how to do it cool and that that was my jam he's a really awesome. cool dude and super shout out to him is he out out of a we go no no he's a he's a bampton guy oh uh, okay he's awesome in a band uh they were called rooster and the roadhouse horns oh i've seen the them name. they were awesome yeah 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 great band oh yeah yeah Check them out, listeners, if you can. Absolutely. What about you, Ross? Like, what what got you, or uh, what was the first instrument you ever picked up? Or? Well, I guess I was forced to play piano when I was uh, younger for a bit. Gotcha. <laughs> but I kind of got out of that. And uh, I remember in middle school, there was a guitar class that you could take instead of chorus. And I remember being lucky enough to get that. And uh, from there, I ended up just buying a guitar. I think it was like an Epiphone Special 2 or something. Awesome. And it came with like a little lamp, so I remember jamming out on that. But eventually, after a while, we kind of started like a metal band-ish, and I had mm -hmm. the drum set at my house just for like somebody to play, and then I finally ended up playing that and getting good along or playing with drums. Cool. That's awesome. Um, how about you? Uh, how about you, John? What was the first instrument um, you ever picked up, buddy? I would have to say guitar. My uh, Nana bought me like a just a little like classical acoustic guitar she probably found at a yard sale for like 20 bucks or something but i just nice i played that a lot and just learned i don't know i would try to play things like uh sabbath or acdc easy enough kind of riffs but gotcha and then from there uh 
when we all started playing, kind of like Ross with the drums, we just needed a bass player and nobody really wanted to play bass. So it's like, all right, I'll play bass. And I <laughs> fell in love with it kind of thing. So you like playing the bass more than any... Nowadays, I, I would I would say, even when we first started, uh, when I started jamming with these three a couple of years ago, I was still like, oh, well, I really want to play guitar too. Yeah. And now that I'm kind of like settled in as a bass player, I, I really love playing bass. That's awesome. And we're all thankful for that because John is a really, really good bass player. He oh, is. Stop. <laughs> Absolutely. Matt? Uh, well, uh, I didn't have an instrument for a while, and I would spend a lot of time at Julian's house and playing his guitars or anything like that or, you know, uh, over at Ross's and stuff like that. And uh, But my first instrument that I owned, I remember getting a, a – it was an acoustic guitar, and it was a, an all-black Indiana Scout and it was only like $100, but I still have that thing, and it's like spray-painted gold at this point. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's nice. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, uh, but, yeah, so that's that. So so now, I mean, obviously you guys really start getting into instruments, and then, I mean, Jimmy, you've been in many bands in your tenure. Yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> so how do you go about forming bands? Like, you guys didn't form Shout Out the Robots right out the gate. You were in a, a few other bands, like starting with Julian? Yeah, um, we... <laughs> We have been in a lot of different bands, and uh, a majority of those bands never played a single show. Uh, there was a combination of a, a big group of friends of us, but a lot of it at its core was John, Ross, and I. Um, bands like Chooks of Hazard was <laughs> my, my favorite name, uh, obviously taken from Ross Marchuka. Um the Losers was one, very creative and original. <laughs> and uh, the the main band when we were um, teenagers in the early 2000s um, was State of Leaf. Okay. And that was actually, initially, that was Ross and John and our friend Dandy Abracci. Uh, and then I kind of just like hung around when they practiced and slowly evolved into the band. Um, so we were together at State of Leaf for... More than one year, at yeah. least uh, a couple years, we put out a few recordings, which I think our MySpace page still exists. Really? Um, oh wow! <laughs> yeah. If anyone really wants to look that up, but I don't recommend it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's like talking about CDs about you, all over again. <laughs> MySpace. <laughs> you can't forget about human test subject. That's right. Yeah. Uh, coinciding. With State of Leaf, there was also uh, a, like a thrash band called Human Test Subject, uh, which featured our friend Shelby Stallings, who could really, really rip on guitar. <laughs> uh, but State of Leaf, um, yeah, like I said, those recordings are out there. Uh, not super dissimilar to Shout at the Robots, honestly. Uh, there was like still that germination of whatever it is you want to call that we do now, even back then. Uh, but we never played any live shows. We tried to book one place and they had like a pay to play thing mm -hmm. and we were like okay no <laughs> and and then like it just never turned in anything else from there uh so that was our initial musical experience uh and then that was still when matt was like learning the ropes on guitar and stuff so he wasn't in that band initially and then as he progressed and developed his own style and stuff then he started jamming with all of us and you know was more in the fold me and Matt also had a uh, like a little acoustic thing we would do every once in a while, and uh, I just remember going over his his place, and we called it Jethro Jesus, and that that was a lot of fun, and we weren't very good either of us, but it was just one of those things we would do anyway, and uh, Julian mentioned Shelby earlier. He was a kid we all hang out hung out with. He was a great guitar player. Doesn't live in the area anymore, but. We were in a band called, uh, well, it had like 10 different names, but uh, Fields of Fire and then Skeletons of Society, which is a Slayer song. <laughs> but uh, me and him jammed a lot together, and I actually, I probably thank him for making me like a better bass player, just because he was, he was easy to follow. He'd just like show me the chords and stuff, and uh, we played like maybe two shows ever, but it, it was fun, and that yeah, that was a good time. Festival Fireman's Hall, right? Yep. Yeah, we played a fire hall with a, a lot of the Omira guys and uh, a few like Vestal bands. I don't know 
any of the guys nowadays. I don't know if they're still around. We were so young, I didn't really know anybody's names, but I can think of a couple band names. There was a Elmira Punk Division we played with, and uh, this band called Cootie Shot. That was really good. And uh, there was a band called The Rot. That was three kids around our age. And Yeah, my friend Nigel was in that band. Was he? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. The Serlingtons actually played with all of those bands you I just won, mentioned. I won, they <laughs> might have been at like the one show we played at, at the fire hall. That would yeah. be really, really wild. Like I said, this was a long time ago, and I could barely play, but Shelby was a really good uh, guitar player, and we played a, a guy named Matt Ebers was our drummer. Okay. And... Uh, or actually, Mike Ebers, sorry. He's got a brother, Matt, who's in the in the scene. He plays with Tom Jolu and a few other bands right oh, now. Nice. And from what I hear, he's he's an awesome drummer, too, like his brother. And uh, Juan Pena was another guy we played with, another super talented guy. He's got a studio now in the city, recording a lot of like high-profile artists. And, you know, it was just fun times back in the day. <laughs> I get rambling, but... No, no, by all means. This is your show. We're just here to listen, man. We, we want to hear about your story. I mean, just because especially going up in small town Owego, you know, the coolest small town in America from what I hear. <laughs> that's what they say. Yeah, well, that's what the sign says, and I believe it. I've been there. I like Owego. Shout out to everybody out there. This, You know, just hearing how everybody's kind of coming together, I mean, you know, as as you're slowly starting out and you're kind of just going through the different, you know, bands you've been in. I mean, Matt, do you have any bands you want, you've been in that you want to jump uh, mention? no. no. I do not. I, I was not in any of those bands other than the Jethro Jesus one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, I think that actually might have a MySpace page still somewhere. Did Jethro well. Jesus yeah. ever play any shows? Oh, no. no. Oh, okay. No, no, no. No. <laughs> no it, it, <laughs> I th- I th- yeah, 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 right. Uh, I think well, that's we a did, show. <laughs> we, did a, we, yeah, we did a cover of uh, what, what, Last Kiss. Last Kiss. Yeah, oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't remember what. I think there's like two originals. Yeah. But they're, they're, they're like, like, three yeah, like maybe two or three chords and just like the same thing over and over again. But, you know, it was a lot of fun. But, you know, it's just like you said, you're young and in bands and just kind of really kind of f- trying to find your way. And, and Ross, you want to jump in with something? So a big factor with making like all those bands, where they were all like different genres and stuff, but. We all threw in together for like an eight track recorder or something. Oh, that was and then moment. just being able to like record stuff and be like, oh, we'll, we'll fix the drums up or something. And then be able, you're being able to put that onto the computer and then listen to it. That's like, well, that's a big, bleh. that was a big influence on us just being able to like make new bands or like learning what style we want to play. Yeah. So just, yeah, basically just going around and, and just, you guys were in different ones and then, you know, at this point, you guys are just kind of always growing up, growing up around each other. So it's kind of like you're ready to start forming a band. And Ken, uh, we'll talk about that soon. But uh, first, I want to I want to play uh, my personal favorite "Shout at the Robot" song, uh, "Amelia on the Moon." So when we get into a little bit of that, you're listening to the "Shout at the Robots" on the ODPH. <laughs> Running late Spoke to the bloody friends I 
coming back for another segment with Shout at the Robots here on the ODPH. Last segment, we were talking about how they got into music and the musical influences growing up and how they really kind of got started with the bands, the bands that they were growing in, growing up with. So, Jimmy, you've been in quite a few bands around town. Yes, I have. You're in a very big one, Floodlands, which is doing a huge show with Shout at the Robots on February yep. 9th. So when you're thinking about starting bands, what do you like look for when you're doing a band? Um, chemistry is the first thing. Um, getting along with everyone, being able to mesh like musically together, mm-hmm. like styles. Um, well, everyone's always going to have different style, of course, but like just seeing if each other's styles mesh and, you know, if we can make something different and cool and, uh, I wanted to ask you guys, like, how did you get your band Shout at the Robots started? Like, what what brought you guys to, uh, like, you told us earlier about other bands, but how did this band specifically start? Well, that depends on how you want to define Shout at the Robots. Um, sure. Because <laughs> Shout at the Robots initially was Ross and I, um, and that was, I think, when I was at college-ish. And uh, this is around 2013, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, just to give our listeners a kind of a background time. Yeah, um, yeah. It, well, probably closer to 2011. Okay, when Ross and I first started it, uh, that was a sort of how would you describe it? A fun time. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's always good. Yeah, it was definitely a fun time. No, it was like a weird. Um, there were a lot of keyboards involved. Okay, and it was more like a synth pop like postal service influence thing oh which cool. is very different than what we're doing now um like chuk said he used to play piano when he was a kid but like neither of us really had any super clear idea what we were doing <laughs> uh but that that's where the name came from um and so we kind of just ran with that there's again a couple recordings of it online that was post myspace so it's probably on like reverb nation or something i don't know um but after i graduated college which was 2013 i moved back to owego and uh that whole time was a long period of like busking and just recording stuff on my own and wishing i was in a band okay so when i moved back here i thought i know these guys they know how to play instruments we've all grown up together like you said chemistry is really important we've always had chemistry uh, oh, we're all really awkward. We don't have chemistry personally, <laughs> but like we come together like Voltron, and that's where the chemistry nice. is. And uh, so the initial showed up the robots as a band was um, me on guitar and vocals, like it is now, Matt on bass, and Ross on drums. And that was 2013, roughly. Okay. Uh, 2014. Um, we. We had never really been in like a gigging band before. Uh, we played a lot of open mics at the John Barleycorn in Owego. Shout out to the Barleycorn. That's where we got our start. And uh, that was kind of how we discovered our footing. We were really terrible most nights. And I apologize <laughs> now to everyone who had to listen to us. <laughs> but uh, occasionally, we were pretty good. Um, and I know that because they recorded it and it was on CD. And most of the time when I listen back to it, it's like, oh, n- n- no. <laughs> there were moments of like okay wow maybe we can do something out of this um i won't speak for these guys but i've always wanted to play music my whole life it's the only thing i feel like i know how to do any well uh but i never really pursued it properly because i was never confident enough in myself to do it i just thought like even though I grew up with DIY culture and punk stuff. I still thought music was like the realm of the gods. Mm -hmm. You know, you're Robert Plant up on stage and I could never be there. Uh, But it was only when we started doing it as a group like that out in front of people that I went, okay, maybe there's something to this. Um, And so we gigged around as a three piece, just playing those barley corn open mics. Uh, But we also, I I knew a guy named Mike Barber when I went to school in Fredonia, which is at the, Opposite end of the state by Buffalo. Oh, yeah, so by Buffalo. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to Fredonia. Damn straight. And <laughs> uh, so he was in a band called Cup Sex. Great name, I know. And uh, <laughs> they <laughs> are really weird. We'll just put it that way. Well, with a name like that, you kind of kind of figure something's a little off oh, yeah. kilter than the, the normal mainstream. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, 
very much off kilter guys in that band, Mike Barber and Travis Whitmore. Shout out to them. Um, but they live in Rome, which is up outside Syracuse. And uh, there was a bar there called Traces. And Traces was a weird bar. Uh, there was always a dog around, which is a nice thing. Uh, but they would have shows there. And specifically those shows uh, would involve the previously mentioned Cup Sex and a couple of different really varied bands. Um, specifically, there was one called No Compliance, who at the time were a three-piece, uh, kind of a street punk, more like rancid influence band. Okay. Uh, really, really cool guys. At this point, probably the tightest band we'd ever played with. Uh, another band called The Awkwards, uh, which were two people, Sam and Ben, uh, who just made, I don't even know how to categorize the music they made, but it was very cool. Uh, and then several other bands. And it was its own scene, a really weird scene. Uh, they actually called it Weird Core. Okay. Which is great because it was a bunch of awkward, misfit, strange people all coming together to make awkward, misfit, strange noise, which is something that really we all identify with. And uh, not only was that our first time traveling somewhere to play a show, playing a show for a majority of people who'd never heard us before, also playing shows with like-minded bands. So that was a really kind of eye-opening experience for us. Uh, That was the first time we ever felt like we could be part of something bigger than what we're just doing on our own. Mm -hmm. Uh, Say what you want about a Wego, there's not a lot of like youth culture there. Uh, it, it's the kind of place where growing up, you want to get out really fast, and that's not a slight against the town. That's just kind of how it is when you're. Well, it's there. just small town. You know, it's small town USA for yeah. anybody that's not there. It's not definitely not a slight to it. But then when you start getting out and getting more exposure as you're going upstate and you know you're traveling outside of there to a bigger city, that's kind of you know it's kind of sparking the itch, so to speak, is what you're trying to say. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. So that makes a little more sense. Yeah. So that was the first time that itch had been scratched. And um, that, that's a really roundabout way of saying that was like our genesis as a band that got, I think, got all of us. John wasn't there at the time yet, but if he was there, he would be thinking the same thing, <laughs> that maybe this is something we can do. And I will say, uh, for people who have seen Shout Out the Robots out wherever, uh, when we're not playing... We have a habit of running up to the stage in front of our friends and getting on our knees and doing thumbs up at them. And <laughs> it's probably really weird to see from far away. I remember the first time I saw somebody else doing it, I was really confused. Uh, we adopted that habit from those guys uh, in the weird core scene. I don't know why they do it, but the first time they did it to us, just having these really goofy dudes on their knees in front of you waving their thumbs <laughs> in the air, it's pretty great. It's hilarious and encouraging and weird. Uh, and so we like to do that to everyone we like. I remember you did that with uh, Crimson Brethren on several occasions. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, there is, because that's actually a notable thing. I was going to wait till later in the show, but I think this is kind of a perfect time to bring, bring up the story about when I first saw you guys play out. Mm-hmm. Because this kind of <laughs> led into you know seeing this happen. And just kind of give a little background. Uh, Shout was opening for Crimson Brethren, ironically, at a show at the Beagle Pub. Shout out to them in uh, JC here in New York. And I remember they were playing super early in the night. I want to say like almost like 8, 830. And Crimson was playing well after midnight. Yeah. And I want to say it was like, they were on near 1 o'clock that night. And there was a couple of bands in between. And, I, and Jimmy was asking me to tape the shows for Crimson. And, I mean, obviously I would. So I get my phone out. I was ready to go. And then they start kicking in the song 1111. If you listen to the ODPH Entertainment Edition, that's the theme song we kick off to. And all of a sudden, the four gentlemen that are actually in my studio here come flying behind me. Like, I don't know what's going on. And my phone goes flying in the air. So I'm making a quick, like, circus catch. And then all of a sudden, Padawan J goes, hey, isn't that shout at the robots? And I'm looking around like, yeah. That is them. <laughs> and then sure enough, you see them just high energy, and then all of a sudden they drop down and they start doing the thumbs up, as Julian is describing here. Oh, yeah. So this is no joke, because I remember sitting there watching, like after making sure my phone's not broken, I'm going, wait a sec, like what, what's going on here? But that does clear it up, because, I mean, that's just something from the scene that's up there yeah. that you kind of implemented and started imp- see, doing on your shows. I never knew that until now. <laughs> so Yeah, I, I, I don't 
tell people why we do it usually <laughs> i kind of like just doing it and seeing how everyone reacts it's been pretty great lately because uh every time we do it now there's a growing uh, amount of people that'll join along with us yeah it's just something i think it just adds to the show a little bit i mean especially because for when you guys were doing that especially if when you've been open and to have that energy and just kind of implement you know the weird core style if i can call that absolutely to you know just into the different bands and kind of seeing the reaction that you know it's almost like kind of introducing everybody to that kind of style because it's just a little different that nobody's really used to seeing it because you don't think okay well why are they dropping down and starting to give a thumbs up and <laughs> and doing that show so i mean that's just a little interesting tidbit there that you guys are doing yeah i love that about you guys though you guys just always have such a positive vibe and like you guys made so many shows just so much fun like Thank you, man yeah thanks uh, always glad to have you <laughs> And I appreciate it. Oh, yeah, totally. And, you know, talking about us having a positive vibe, we were having a conversation not that long ago. Uh, I found an article online. That it was talking about, like, a genre of probably more like cyberpunk or steampunk or whatever, that kind of thing, and not a musical genre. Mm. But uh, it was this idea that they called hope punk. And it was just uh, kind of like aggressive positivity almost nothing uh, wrong with that yeah and that cool reading that whole article which i'm not going to sum up now because it'd take a long time you know i talked to these guys all about it and we agreed that that all kind of sums up the approach that we try to take uh we play a style of music that a lot of people regard as something like that's inherently kind of violent uh, or stupid, or whatever they were initially saying about punk uh, in its inception, and even up to now. And, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, punk that's like that. But I also like the idea that we're a group of four, like, weird dad bod guys who, yeah. <laughs> who, who play, who play um, music that could be categorized as angry or whatever. And I like kind of twisting the narrative of that on its head and being positive about it. I think the content of our songs speaks to hopefully all kinds of emotions. And I don't want to be like overly positive and ignore anything negative because I'm a goth at heart. And uh, obviously I want to include the dark stuff, but I think ultimately what we're trying to do here is be positive. Absolutely, man. Um, how would you, what's the best way to describe your sound you'd say? That is a really interesting question. Um, <laughs> I actually want to pose that to everybody in the band. Like when somebody yeah. says, "What is? How does your band sound?" What is the easiest description you say? Yeah, I'm. I'm just as curious as you guys are to hear what these three have to say. Because <laughs> uh, a lot of people have asked me that question. Um, I've been a bartender for a long time now, and that gives me the opportunity to shamelessly plug myself to people all the time. Uh, if it feels appropriate. I'm not just like, hey, uh, have a drink. By the way, I'm in a band. Yeah. But, you know. <laughs> um, and that question always inevitably comes up. And sometimes I change it depending on who I'm talking to. Like if it's someone that looks like they're not super well-versed in different kinds of music, I'll just say we're a rock and roll band. Because at heart, we're a rock and roll band. Absolutely. You know, we have two guitars, bass, and drums, and we play a lot of stuff in 4-4 four, four that's like mid-tempo. Okay, it's rock and roll. Uh, we, Other than that, I say we're a punk band or we're an alternative rock band, which is really kind of the best umbrella term for us. Uh, I'd like to liken us to like, the discord bands of the late eighties and the early nineties or, um, you know, early indie bands before indie became the weird buzzword for like folky stuff that it is now. Um, you know, uh, we're influenced more by like Fugazi or super chunk or dinosaur junior bands that developed in the underground and didn't really have like a clear genre category. That's yeah. what I would describe us as being close to. But Great bands, too. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. But you can't really like say all that in conversation. So I just say, you know, we're an alternative rock punk band, whatever. Yeah. All right, Ross. Uh, every time answering that question, I don't know. It's usually it'll be like, uh, well, we're like a punk band, uh, kind of alternative. Go over here and there with just about anything, but we play whatever pretty much. 
but uh, when someone, yeah, when someone usually just answers that, or when someone asks me that, I usually just go like, oh, we're weirdcore. And that just leaves like <laughs> a blank for them. And then I just like, fill in your own mystery. Fair enough. Matt, how about you? Well, for me, it's, you know, along the same lines as those guys. I just tell them we're a punk band. Uh, I, I, I typically try to take the easy way out when it comes to that question. Uh, I might even be doing that right now. I'm not sure. Um, I don't know, John. Uh, like Matt said, pretty much what these guys have already said. I like to say we're a rock and roll band to people who don't really listen to a lot of different kind of music because that's just a pretty broad term. And I feel like you know we all like rock and roll, and it's easier than describing the actual sound. But uh, I've always liked to say it's a mix between Fugazi and Pavement, and those are two bands that I that's a great analogy really liked. So and yeah, just alternative punk kind of indie, you know, whatever. Jimmy, let me ask you, how do you describe Shout at the Robots? Oh man. <laughs> I'm throwing everybody the curveballs yeah. tonight here. Throwing me under the bus. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. At least I'm reaching out to grab you here, buddy. So <laughs> Oh man. Well they're I just think they're a great punk rock band. That's how I always have seen them, but they I hear a lot of cu- the cure in your guys' nice. music. Thanks, man. Definitely Fugazi. Um even a little alkaline trio here and there. Right on. I don't know if that's no, anything. Lo- love no, the trio. Yeah, I would love all those. Love bands. the trio and the cure. Sweet. Um, yeah, I mean, like the, for me, it's like I kind of hear post punk alternative. Like that, I know uh, Josh Thornton actually shout out to him said the same thing on your Facebook yeah, page yeah. about that. I think that does, and especially you know here and where how much influences from growing up and just how the different musical styles are all kind of mashed together. And I totally love the Fugazi meets yeah. Pavement analogy. I think that nails it right also, on the head. That's my favorite. Too. I hear some Pixies <laughs> in there too. Oh for yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, that's a big influence. There's just so much that goes on with that. That just you know, and you can see that when it goes into like your songwriting. So before we get into the next song, we're going to play. Like, what goes into a typical shot of the robot song? What's the formula? <laughs> yeah, um, that that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, as a band, we try to keep the process pretty democratic. Everything is always open to everyone in the band as far as decision making goes, and so in terms of songwriting, that usually translates to we just get together in our practice space and we'll just kind of jam on stuff and. The great thing about having all grown up together and knowing each other for so long is that we have that like instinctive mindset of knowing where the other person is going really down pat. And so, you know, we're actually able to write songs like that as opposed to just kind of noodling around in a dark room for six hours. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, so, you know, that's usually how it'll initially start out. We'll just kind of get together and play. And if someone has a cool idea, uh, we'll just we won't even verbally point it out to each other. We'll just kind of all get on the same wavelength and, uh, yeah, build on that. So there's not like one sole songwriter. It's like all of you write the songs. Well, there, there's a couple different processes to what we do. Cool. And I, I think, uh, a lot of that is because we don't really know what we're doing. And, uh, <laughs> I, I look at that as a virtue. No, that absolutely is because you want to, because if you're doing like, you're so influenced by punk rock, it's so D- DIY mm-hmm. that, yeah, you want to kind of just kind of go in there and see what happens. You just not really kind of have a, you know, so to speak, so to speak, a set formula. Yeah, exactly. And, and just kind of see what sticks and just what everybody's adding to the formula. Totally. And that's a really good point. Um, I think like a lot of the core of what we do is uh, I always go back to the idea of the weirdness and just stuff that's kind of outside the norm or turning the narrative on its head. Uh, and in that we record in that jamming way, like I just said. Or sometimes uh, one of us will have an initial idea for a song, kind of a skeleton. I think I do the most like traditional verse, chorus, verse writing with everything, um, because I'm really interested in songwriting and how that works. And I like can't help myself, but like kind of try and write a little bit formulaic sometimes, because I know if I bring an initial formulaic structure to the band, by the time that song is done, it'll be out there and it'll have all kinds of influence to it that's not what i've put in initially and i really like that as far as how this band works as a group uh there have been a couple of songs that matt's brought in where he's done that initial skeleton and his songwriting is totally different than mine and uh almost more simplistic 
And I don't want to say that because like that sounds like it could be insulting, and I totally don't mean that. But I mean, I try to like cram in a bunch of like stupid ideas that probably won't work into what I'm doing. And the first time Matt brought in a song that he wrote on his own, I was like, "Wow, this is like a real song. Like this is a song that's going to get stuck in people's heads all the time." And it does. And it does. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it's called <laughs> "Just Fine." Uh, it's on our album. And we're constantly quoting the words at him all the time. <laughs> uh, Great song, by the way. <laughs> right? Yeah. He also does a turn on vocals there. Um, but ultimately, like I said, it's all kind of democratic. Uh, nobody has any final say in the songwriting. Uh, we all bring our own unique, strange aspects to it. And uh, if you like our music, that's why. A lot of times there's like a five second clip of like a guitar or a bass line that... Uh, when we're playing or something and then i don't know i'll just be like can you wait take that back all right then i'll just throw in like a little drum beat to that i'm like does that sound good or what if i try it like this way and usually like like that's one of the ways i would just morph a bunch of songs and yeah i was gonna say basically the same thing a lot of times it'll start as just you know matt's playing a guitar riff or something and it's like hey did you come up with that yeah okay well uh keep keep playing that let me let me try to come up with something to that and a lot of the times we'll change it and, you know, like Julian was saying, if one of us comes with an idea, a lot of the times it's so different than how it started. Just all of us adding our own little touch. And I've always liked that about us. I will say that um, with a lot of my favorite bands and just good music in general, I always think it comes down to having a really tight rhythm section. It's not a requirement. But when you have one, it really just means that all the melodic stuff has an awesome bedrock to work off and you can basically do whatever you want. And I feel like Chuke and John are super solid at what they do. And uh, I'm always really happy with everything all three of these guys come up with when we're writing stuff. I don't think I've ever told them that in person, so I just feel like I should oh. say it to potentially <laughs> however many people are listening to this. There's going to be quite a few folks and definitely hit us up on the hashtag, hashtag S-A-T-R. Definitely let the guys know what you're thinking of the music. We're going to take a quick break, but let's get into a little more shout out to Robots Music. This one, I got to say, one of the most unique names I've heard. It's Death by Snoo Snoo. You are listening to the ODPH. Shout at the robots on the ODPH. So I wanted to talk to you guys about the live shows. 
the live shows actually the first time i ever met you guys the we go strawberry fest i think it was crimson brethren cast and shout out the robots is mm-hmm. that right yeah yeah but anyway like what do you guys what do you guys think of your live shows do you enjoy the crowds or have you guys been playing outside of the area anywhere or because now as the band has started it's 2013 and obviously i mean you guys have sounded better each show i've seen you and i've seen you at a handful now but how would you like what Jimmy's saying is like how would you describe your crowds and like you know from where you started like your first live show to where you're at now? That's an interesting question because when we started uh, initially, our sets were just all covers. Uh, we didn't have any. We didn't wait to write any songs before we started playing shows, uh, and then we slowly snuck the originals in there as we learned how to write essentially, um, and so kind of everyone discovered our abilities along with us uh but our choice of covers really like got people interested initially because as we've already covered we're influenced by a lot of different bands and that came out in that and people responded pretty well to that um and the mix of the originals and that went over really well we decided uh probably a year and a half ago more or less to just stop doing covers almost entirely uh when we have to play like a three hour long show at the barley corn in a wego or something like that obviously we don't have the original material to sustain that but um once we switched over to playing originals we lost a lot of the like casual bar crowd kind of like people who were there to you know just see whatever's happening but we gained more of people in other bands and Mm -hmm. like you know people who are more involved in the scene or whatever and uh i think that's because what we're doing is more what we're doing originally is more relative to like those people you know uh specifically to other musicians i guess at least in this area just because those are the people who happen to be on the safe kind of wavelength that we are uh so i wouldn't say it's a bad thing uh you know i don't think we've like lost any crowd i just think we've kind of developed a different one uh but on the subject of that i will say like you said ken very nicely uh we've developed a lot as time has gone by and one of the things that people say to us most often is every single show it's like oh you sound so much better than you did at the last show Mm -hmm. Uh, which means that we're getting better which is i mean that's our ultimate goal as a band is to get better and hone our craft etc etc uh initially when we first started playing There's, like, video of it here and there. We're just, like, really standing still, staring at our instruments, trying to put on a good show, but also really trying to concentrate on what we're doing. And I only feel like it's within the last year or so that we've really, like, started to hit our stride as a live band and are starting to make the show actually, like, more entertaining to watch. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I mean, people were able to see that we kind of knew what we were doing beforehand, but now we're all confident enough in what we're doing that it comes across and it's something that people like seeing more, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, like I say, I remember the first show I saw yet and and it's, and it's not a slight by any means, but yeah, you could definitely see, you know, you kind of, we're just, you know, getting into the feel of playing live and just, you know, not really, I don't want to say like interacting, but it was just kind of like, okay, like you were saying, just, I think you were more focused on playing, you know, the music, right. Instead of just kind of embracing what the live crowd is. Mm -hmm. Obviously, has been like I said. Every time you're sounding better, and you're and you're looking more comfortable in front of crowds too, which I, I know. yeah, which is yeah, which I mean, it's an honest statement. I'm not getting any paid for this, so <laughs> I want to clarify this. But it's just one thing that when you're seeing live, it's just kind of you're really showing the growth that like a band should be doing that at each show. Just every time we're seeing something different, seeing something new, but yet keeping the essence of what makes you guys you. So awesome. definitely love hearing stuff like that. And- Love hearing that we're high energy because that's something that like, we we really like. I don't know. We'd like to, like Julian said, at, at first it was hard to move around and you're just kind of really just trying to play it perfect. And now it's more like, well, we can move around and have fun. And when somebody says, oh, that was a lot. You guys got a lot of energy. I just always like hearing stuff like that because those are the kind of bands we like watching. And it's more entertaining and let me ask you this too, because this just this question just popped up. Because as you said, when you first started out, you're just doing covers, and you were more or less a cover band, if that's a fair statement to say. Yeah. 
But now do you see that as you're growing and you're doing your own more original stuff, that's where you feel more comfortable and then that's where kind of the energy is kicking into another gear, would you say? Yeah. 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 That's probably a big part of it is we're more comfortable playing the originals and like just the more practice we get playing those songs, we can kind of like gives us a little leeway to goof around and stuff. You don't have to like be nervous about playing it right because you're like, I got this. I've played it a million times just go out and have fun and you know an audience isn't isn't gonna care if you hit a slip note or something but they're gonna remember if they're like oh wow they put on a really good show and oh absolutely because i mean you never know who's gonna see you for the first time when you go to a show and you always want to leave them with a lasting impression of you know hey these guys are pretty good or you know this is the greatest thing i've ever seen you don't want anybody going like, I just wasted my time, you know, watching them <laughs> playing a lot of weird stuff and giving thumbs up, and I have no idea what the heck <laughs> yeah. this is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, that just goes to show just, I mean, when you're putting stuff in and when you go to a live show and you're giving that energy back, and I think when we had uh, Rob Kacherik on from Walking Distance, we were talking yeah. about that. When you're giving off that much energy and it's coming back at you, I mean, just how is that feeling, especially That's is, your, is yeah. your own originals and it's your own music. It's 100% shout at the robots and just seeing the reaction from people. Yeah, that that's like, you know, that's not all of why you do it, but that's kind of at the core of why you do it. I love to look out at a crowd and especially to people who uh, I know I've never seen us play before. And I love seeing that spark in somebody's eyes when it's like, oh, okay, that person over there, they get it. And that's my favorite feeling in the world. And when people are being enthusiastic about what we're doing, that's great. Uh, we played a show at the Ransom Steel in Appalachian. Uh, great place for a live show. Right? Um, Brian Wolf who, from Fair City Fire, who he's on the show when he's yeah. in town from Texas, always plays there. Love going there for a live show. Uh, shout out to both Ransom Steel and Fair City Fire. Um, we played there last December, and it was really cool because there was this – couple they had to have been over 70 that, that's my best guess for their age and they got up and just busted a move to our set and they danced for a whole song and i, I don't Put know all what the song it was but yeah it, it was really cool and i don't I don't know why they were feeling it in that moment, but that was great to see. You never know how music's going to hit people, especially, you know, where you're playing a weird core style, you know, a post-punk alternative. Yeah. However, you know, everybody defines the S-T-A-R sound, which that should be a good question to post up on Twitter. Hashtag it S-A-T-R. What does the sound sound like when you hear the episode? Yeah. That You just never know how that's going to hit somebody, and especially hitting somebody, you know, that's a demographic that, Quite frankly, that music was not the style when they were growing up, and just kind of seeing the reaction it's getting from them. I mean, that just goes to show just how much energy you're putting in and how it's resonating with the fans or the audience, you know, whichever one you wanted to find people that are at your shows. I think that's just a very cool thing to see. It makes it easier to, to like get more into it when you look out and there's, even if it's just one person nodding their head or something, it, it makes it easier for you to, okay, somebody's. Like Julian said, that spark, like, I don't know how to describe it, really, but you feed off that energy. Okay, they're getting into it. I'm going to get more into this. Where when you look out and there's nobody really into it, it just makes you want to try even harder to get somebody's attention. And even if you just affect that one person, that makes a huge difference. Ross? Uh, when we played the Galaxy Fest, I think that was. Is that right? I, um... One of the harder songs I got, like I usually play, and it's a pain in the ass. It's called "Never Stationary." Never Stationary. Uh, I'm like hitting on the hi hats for like at least sixteens or something. And I'm just like, damn it, damn it, damn it. And when we were playing there, I looked over and there's like a whole table just eating food or something, and they were all just playing air drums along with me. And I looked at that and I was like, it gave me like such a boost of confidence and everything. And I was like, all right, I can just play the rest of this like nothing now. No, that's awesome to see. That I mean, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's just like the little things. Just you know, that you're making the connection. Right? Yeah. There's like a weird demographic, too, which I wouldn't expect them to get into it. And I was just like, all right, well, that's really cool. I appreciate that. You just never know how reaching music is. I mean, that's just the one thing. Especially, you know, Jimmy, you got something you want to jump in with? Yeah, I, I, I've i been wanting to ask you guys this for a while now because I haven't really seen you guys in a while. But uh, how was it working at Abandoned Studios with Mike Mecha? Like, how was your experience? <laughs> that That was super cool. Um, Misha is the kind of person that we just clicked with almost immediately. It's like a fifth robot. Uh, yeah, almost. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> totally. He's a great guy. Yeah. 
Uh, so shout out to Misha and to Abandoned. Uh, if you're a musician and you're looking for a local place to record, um, definitely look him up. Couldn't recommend it enough. Yeah, yeah Phil, Phil Better sounds great. So I, you, he does good work, man. Oh, for sure. You guys obviously did great work on that. But. Thanks, dude. Yeah, absolutely. Not, not only did he uh, mix, master, and engineer the whole thing, he also did the artwork. Yeah, and it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, you can definitely check it out if you go to the music section at ochoduroparleyhour.com. We have the links up for all the Shadow of the Robots, and we have our, all their social media, rather, and we have their album cover right on our site, too. And it is an impressive piece of artwork, I gotta yeah, say. It's great artist. Oh, it is. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've done all of the artwork for anything related to the band so far, but when it came time to do the album cover, it was like, no, don't, don't leave that in my hands. And we didn't really know what we were gonna do. And then we just realized, oh, we're working with this super talented guy who not only knows the ins and outs of all the music, he's great at art and graphic design and collage work so yeah he just knocked that out of the park really quickly uh but yeah i mean overall that experience of working in abandoned studios was really really cool the studio space itself um it wasn't anything at all what i expected it to be uh yeah, it's a big space <laughs> right yeah it, it's in uh an old factory building in yeah. downtown johnson city it used to be called the spool menu the spool manufacturing yeah thing. yeah uh weird tidbit of information my like great great grandfather worked there oh wow <laughs> yeah so that's that felt, awesome <laughs> right it felt like a weird family thing to work there again but yeah just being in that space working with Mitch's equipment and Mitch himself it's the first uh quote-unquote professional recording we had ever done before as we talked about before we've been recording ourselves since we were teenagers but like we've never been to a studio really up to that point uh so we were all kind of nervous didn't really know what we were doing the material that's on fail better is all the songs that we had written up to that point in time uh as a group so that's like two years worth of songs roughly and it was just kind of us figuring our stride out as a band um and i think that kind of plays out on the album uh, it's it's a little all over the place, which yeah. I don't think is a bad thing, but I just think it means the next thing we put out is going to be that much better. You guys you guys working on any new material right now? Yeah. Got a uh, couple. Yep. We, we've got, hopefully, uh, we're actually going to be back and abandoned at the end of February, beginning oh, of March. Man, that's awesome. Right? Yeah, we're looking forward to it. Uh, we're going to put out an EP, probably five or six songs or so awesome yeah so That's there is news <laughs> yeah th there is definitely more robots material uh i think this is the first time anyone's ever heard of it so we will let you know when that's coming out and hopefully you guys will like it as much as we do awesome man thanks yeah. but let's get into some current shout at the robots shall we this is my favorite song off the track or the album this is it's really late and the world is ending you are listening to shout at the robots on the odph
Shout out the robots on the ODPH. So, Jimmy, there's a big show coming up February 9th. Yes, you, there is. You're going to be playing on it with these guys? Yep. So, why don't you start talking about the show, shall um, we? The show, yeah, the show is going to be at uh, Kevin Kober and Michelle Kessler, two good friends of mine. They're having it at their venue, uh, Subterranea. And it's uh, on February 9th. And uh, Amber Martin, who's a singer songwriter, she's going to open the show. And. Uh, Shout out the robots for they're going to be playing next. Then uh, unethical, great uh, one of Kevin's bands actually, a great heavy hardcore band. And then uh, the challenge from uh, Brooklyn, New York, good friends, good friends of mine uh, used to play with Crimson. They're going to be playing, and uh, then Floodlands. And who's they? The band I'm in with uh, Tom Dowd, Nick Donatelli, and my brother Bill Gazdick. Floodlands is going to be on the ODPH later this week, but let me ask the guys from Shout Out the Robots this. How excited are you for this show coming up? We are unbelievably excited for this, Ken. And uh, a lot of that is oh. due to the fact that we love Jim. Well, yeah. Love you guys, too. <laughs> and Bill and Tom. We don't know Nick, but we love him, too. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we were obviously big fans of Crimson. We love playing with them, and we love the music they put out, and we've been just like pretty much everyone Thanks, else man. Oh, no problem dude just like everyone else i've talked to about this we've been super anticipating floodlands uh i know you guys have put out some of your practices online and stuff and we that's like made the anticipation even greater it sounds really Sweet. really cool Thanks, man. Yeah, like if I didn't already love you guys so much i'd be really interested in that because you're playing the kind of music that there isn't really any of that around here and I'm yeah. really happy that it's gonna be here now. Yeah, we're we're tr we're trying to do something different, like play some some stuff that we really just love, and all of our influences are different. But you know, we'll see we'll see what we could bring to the table. You know, <laughs> totally, and, man. Looking forward to it. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> and let me ask you this: Now, there's so many different bands that are gonna be at this show at Subterranea. How would you describe the local scene around here? Whole lot of love. Everyone's so nice. And it, uh, if it wasn't for like all these people around here, we wouldn't even have our foot through the door. From the show we played at Strawberry Fest, uh, Cast was the one that wanted us to get booked, and that's a big thanks to Dave Ross. Uh, he'll also be playing in Unethical on the show on the 9th. Um, uh, and then from there, pretty much Jimmy, uh, here right now, was uh, uh, kind enough to have us uh, play like a bunch of other shows, and that's what really got our foot through the door. All right, Julian? Yeah. Uh, the thing that I really like about the Binghamton scene, which is, I mean, our adopted home, like I said, there wasn't a scene in a Wego, and I don't think anybody else would take us anywhere else around. Um, <laughs> one, again, I say this all the time, but Jim, you are totally the catalyst for us being here. Uh, well, that's so, for sure. major props well, to you. I know you're going to deny it, but just take <laughs> it. Don't deny uh, it. If you've Thanks, never met man. Jimmy in person, Jimmy is way too humble for the amount of help he does for the Binghamton music scene, and I, I will be the first one to attest to that. Totally. Well, thanks, guys. You guys uh, are great, though. So thanks, man. We're, we're lucky to have you. <laughs> Likewise. Uh, but <laughs> no, the, the Binghamton scene is super varied, uh, and it was kind of interesting when we first came onto it because. Like I said, you know, we, we all grew up listening to punk and punk-related things, which so much of it is about community. Um, but we had never really been a part of a community like that before. Uh, and it's really cool to come into that and be accepted by everybody around here and by a bunch of bands that are all over the place. Um, when we give shout-outs to people, I'll name those bands specifically. But we just really immediately felt like, here is a big group of people who are only going to judge us by the music that we're playing and are going to take it at face value. And like, there was no hostility or anything. Um, I, none of the like schisms that there are in punk scenes, like everywhere around the country. And uh, I think it's really unique, really cool. Everybody helps each other out for the most part. And we're really happy to be a part of it. All right, John. Uh, the thing I like about the scene is that it's, constantly changing i feel like we've only really been a part of the scene if you even consider us a part of it uh for a couple of years and it, we've seen like a lot of changes and i think it's going in like a good direction you got people like micah another huge shout out to him booking bands at laurel now and we've seen just 
a lot of like diversity when we first kind of were playing there's a lot of hardcore bands and we love a lot of those bands but it's nice to see just all sorts of bands now i feel like and you get a little discouraged when people talk about the way this scene used to be and like oh well it used to be like this and it's like well now we just got to work harder to make it better like let's make it like that or let's move on to new things and, totally. you know that kind of thing absolutely absolutely matt uh, not to just keep reiterating everything everyone else is saying, but, you know, back to what Julian said about community and with Ross, with the whole love thing, it's just like everybody, I haven't met anyone who hasn't just been there with, like, open arms and ready to just, like, you know, do whatever they can to, like, help us get into the scene more and all the, you know, with, you know, sometimes we we show up late or something like that and no one's ever given us a hard time or anything like that so it's just it's awesome just having people that are so accepting and it's just it's it's great yeah uh, that's awesome to hear i wanted to know like what what's uh what's in store for shout at the robots at the rest of 2019 <laughs> yeah uh well like i said hopefully we'll have an ep out here um Probably, I'm going to say mid-March is when that's going to come out. Awesome. Well, that's when we're going to record it. That would be right? eh, some, oh, no. Somewhere around there. It'll be like s- spring-ish when that comes out. <laughs> um, after that, uh, I mean, basically our plan is to just like really kick things into overdrive this year. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm proud of what we've done so far, but we also could have done a lot more up to this point. And that's not a slight on anybody. This is kind of how things worked out. But I think our goal for this year is to really, really play as many shows as we can, write as many songs as we can, just be like the best possible band we can be. Uh, because what else would we be doing this for? You know, we love what we're doing. So I think 2019 is going to be the year that Shout Out the Robots suck less than we've ever sucked <laughs> before. You guys, you guys have any plans for any touring? At uh, all? That's that's the next big hurdle that we're trying to jump. Uh, I awesome. I think this year, at some point, hopefully, um, we're gonna do at least a weekend tour, if not multiple weekend. Those tours. are so much fun. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I mean, we got to start small. Um, Absolutely. I I will say we haven't done any touring up to this point. Uh, we've played out of town shows before. The furthest out we've played uh, was in State College, PA. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah, at a venue that is unfortunately not there anymore um, called the Hush Room, RIP. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> as our only like kind of touring experience, like we loaded all our equipment in a big car and drove for four hours and came back so yeah sure it was a tour you guys still uh, have the big van <laughs> no it's dead now ah, bummer. yeah yeah that's that's actually kind of our our main hurdle in um why we're not playing a million shows at the moment is transportation but gotcha. once we get that sorted we will get out there and uh we'll get back to doing the thing that we think we do best you guys played Elmira before too yeah yeah i can't believe we haven't brought that up already uh yeah shout out to the elmira scene and all the guys out there billy edkin he was one of the guys yeah bill's rad yeah yeah great guy yeah yeah Yeah. Billy guys great guys billy and mike miller have uh put on the shows that we've played there so far um and i think both of them are now in different bands than oh um, okay yeah but i mean whatever those guys are doing and the people out there their scene is really cool and uh I would encourage people to look into what they're doing. Just a quick question. I, I can't remember little, not too much off topic, but yeah. did, uh, was Billy and Billy and Elmira punk division. I can't remember. I, I think he was, I think he was at one point. Yeah. Yeah. I thought so. Yeah. But totally. That's all. <laughs> right. If anybody watching this is Billy Edkin, let us know. <laughs> you, you can definitely find out on YouTube or hit him up on the social media. Hashtag S A T R. So uh, I hear you guys are doing a show with uh, Ari Lehman, the first Jason Voorhees of Friday, Friday the 13th. Yeah. And uh, Kevin set it up at Galaxy. When is the show? Uh, that amazing show uh, is going to be on Saturday, May 11th. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And the Jasons are playing. If, if you guys have ever heard the Jasons, they're they're amazing. Like, Well, Jimmy, why don't you break it down? Who are the Jasons? Um, they're... they're uh, uh, like almost a Ramones core, like themed Friday the Thirteenth band. 
Just okay. Really cool stuff. Really, uh, they've even done Ramones and Misfits covers before live, but and they switch things around. I don't know, but they're it's it's a fun time. You guys are gonna have fun with them, I think. And Ar- Ari kills it live. He shreds on a guitar, and it's gonna be so cool yeah. just to meet meet the guy. Or... Meet yeah. the original Jason. The original <laughs> yeah. Jason. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, super nice guy though. Very sweet guy. Uh, very humble. Very, uh, very uh, outgoing. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, for that show specifically, we're going to be um, doing a thing we did once before a couple Halloweens ago. We're going to be playing uh, an entire Misfits cover set as the Misfits. That's so, awesome. <laughs> yeah, we're we're looking forward to it. Sweet, Kev- yeah. Kevin was really excited about that. I know that. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm really thankful to him for giving us that opportunity because it's going to be pretty cool. Absolutely. <laughs> this is going to be a huge show for you, and looking like 2019 is going to be a very, very big year for Shout Out the Robots. Very excited to hear about that. So the band has elected Julian to do the shout outs for the show to close out this podcast. So Julian, why don't you take it away? Yeah, I have many. Uh, and Ross gave me a very specific piece of paper here that says that Ross would like to thank Dan Diabracci, the Demon Bowler, and Ryan Marchuka. All worthy of thanks. Other than that, we would like to give a shout out to Jimmy, of course, but specifically Floodlands and Crimson Brethren, because those are both great bands. Kevin Kober, who we've already brought up, uh, and the bands that he is in, Talk Hard, Walking Distance, and the Bro Bros, who also all contain super cool people. Uh, Brianna from Talk Hard was in a band called If Man Is Five, who is really cool, and uh, Alex is in Cold Sweats, who we love, uh, as well as Tom Dowd, who's in the Bro Bros. Um, he's an amazing guitarist. We love Tom, and he has a project called Jameer, who uh, everybody should check out if they can. Um, more shout-outs to bands we love, like If Madrid, uh, Underground River, Yard Party, um Maddie Novak, who isn't in a band right now, but um, we've played with a lot of her bands. She's really, really cool. Uh, same with our friend Carrie, who is also not in a band, but she's a great musician. Second Suitor, uh, Imperials from Ithaca, who unfortunately are just going on hiatus now, but we love those guys. Um, a couple of bands are splitting off from them, uh, one of which is Falcon Cat, and I'm sure you can look up the others if you like. Um, our friends Cup Sex and No Compliance, who we've already brought up, uh, Tom Jolu, Unethical. Uh, there's a band in Michigan called Audrey Byrne, members of whom are supporters of ours, and we are totally supporters of theirs, who everybody should check out. Uh, Molina, um, some good friends of ours, DJs, uh, Thaddeus and Drama. We probably wouldn't be where we are without them. Uh, they initially did a lot of our live sound, and they are really cool dudes. Um, venue wise, Subterranea is a very, very cool place. We love it there. Uh, as well as Avenue DIY, totally book a show with them. Awesome people. Uh, the Genome Collective, which I don't know if they book shows there still, um, but they're another Binghamton venue who we think is great. Anybody else? The Purple Room is a big one. Oh, uh, yeah. Laurel Bowl, Mike and Nice, he's been doing a lot for the scene lately. And I can't thank him enough, like, as a band. Of- feel like he's you know he likes us we like him he's gotten us some good shows and good guy no for sure yeah micah is an incredible dude and uh, i'm sorry i did not mention you before micah uh that also reminds me of a band that he's in uh called brighter days very very cool and yeah and uh the omira scene that we talked about before uh people like mike miller and billy edkin uh you guys are awesome and to anyone else who we didn't mention uh don't think we don't love you because we do Oh, wait, actually, special shout out to the ODPH and Ken M because uh, we really are happy that we're here. And thank you, man, for having us. Oh, no, absolutely. Thank you guys for coming out. I mean, you guys braved the polar vortex coming in from out of town to the sub-degree weather that is the ODPH Studios 2 here. We do appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, shout out the robots. You can find their links to all their social media and their band camp on the ODPH webpage ochoduroparleyhour.com check the music section it has all the music that you hear on the podcast along with the bands we interview too we are super super excited to have shout out the robots on there they got the huge show coming up february 9th at subterranea so definitely check that out if you have the opportunity so for john mcbride matt jane ross marchuka julian hepworth jimmy gazdick 
I'm your host, Ken. Thank you, as always, for listening to the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour Spotlight Edition. We'll see you next time.